On the 3rd of August 2004, the Nigerian police raided one of the most dreadest and infamous shrines in Nigeria, the Okija Shrine, Hiyala, Anambra State, 2004. The police gets an anonymous tip from a fellow native doctor, ironically, telling them that there was something going on in Ogugwapu Shrine, something odd, something obscene, something even the gods forbade. What on earth could that be? What could possibly be going on in the infamous Ogugwapu Shrine? that someone had to sneakily inform the police, a fellow native doctor at that, put in mind that the practice of the Ogugwapu shrine, that is the practice of the Okija shrine, was something of public knowledge. It wasn't something that was happening in secret. Everyone knew about the Okija shrine. Everyone knew how it operated. Everyone knew how it worked. Even the police themselves knew about the Okija shrine was that infamous. But then, at what point did they cross the line that the police had to be involved and people had to be arrested? In this video, we're going to talk about the practice of the Okija Shrine as we know it or as recorded. We're going to look at the history, the legend, and definitely the scandal that made it even more famous, if I am to add. Because if not for the scandal, I don't think many more people would have known about it as we do today. And I don't think we would be talking about it right here on this channel. And maybe if we have time, we could look at the aftermath of this scandal and see, you know, what happened afterwards. But before we continue, you know what to do. Don't forget to click the like button. Give this video a thumbs up. Let me know the country you're watching from in the comments below. Subscribe and turn on the bell button if you haven't. And if you have spent time, you can simply just share to your social media platforms. Alright, let's continue. When the police chief, Mr. Tafa Balogun, got this information, got this tip off about the Ogugwapu shrine, he quickly mobilized his men and what they did next was to go and visit the shrine themselves, was to go and see for themselves and apparently it's almost as if they knew what they were going to expect when they got there. So they pretty much went prepared with their guns, their handcuffs, even with the photographer because whatever it was, they knew it was something that needed to be documented. And the moment they stepped into the forest pathway leading to the shrines, they were met with one of the most disgusting, shocking, morbid, and horrific discovery. I guess from the very instant they stepped their foot into the forest, they kind of knew what the report was about. It was basically instant. They did not even need to go deep into the shrines to see what this reporter was saying. On their way to the Ogugwapu shrine, along the pathway, along the bushy pathway, they were met with series of coffins, caskets. And you would think, okay, are these just wooden caskets dropped around the forest? Maybe someone who made coffins dropped them here and wanted to sell them? Apparently, these coffins held dead people in it, which was kind of odd. I guess this was just unusual. According to some sources, they said it was over 80 coffins that were littered around the forest of the Okija Shrine. 80 coffins with 80 dead humans in them, scattered all around in the bushes by the corners. Some of them had lids open. The stench everywhere was just morbid, putrefied, horrible. It was like a dustbin for dead people. What could this be all about? What is all this? Is this a case of money rituals or is something just not right with these people? The entire site felt like a cemetery on land. Except for this particular instance, the dead were not buried in the ground. They were left in their caskets above the ground, decomposing on the open atmosphere. This was an eyesore. This was horrible. This was just beyond imagination. Some of the coffin lids that were closed had to be opened to confirm that indeed all of them, all 80 of these coffins or more, had dead people in them. And apparently that was the case. So we have 80 coffins with 80 dead people in it. Clearly it could have even been more. Some of the coffins there were not as fresh as the newer ones. There were old ones that seemed to have been there longer than over a year. There were newer ones, there were fresher ones, there were the ones that was currently in their decomposition stage, there were others that had dried out bones, which means they may have been there longer than a year. So what in the Friday the 13th is going on here? What in the horror show is going on here? What is this? Night of the Living Dead? And the very unique thing about this dead people in these coffins is that they were all set for burial. So this was not like people killed and thrown in a coffin. This was not like people cut into pieces. This was not like people murdered and just distributed or littered all around. It's not like the Ibadan forest of Aura where the victims' bodies were cut into pieces and littered around the forest. The dead people in this Okija Shrine scandal were fully dressed in their caskets, in their tuxedos, in their gowns, with cotton wool in their nose and ears, positioned as though 
though they were being prepared for burial. And that was the case. Every single body recovered from this shrine at the time, 2004, were due for burial. These are actual people who had died in their homes under whatever condition or situation that had been dressed, embalmed most likely, and prepared for burial. So why weren't they buried? Why were they dumped in the forest of the Okija shrine? Why? Well, as shocking as this scenario is, there is an explanation. This is not a new practice. This is something that clearly has been going on before the police came. And I'm sorry to say, it's still happening now, after the scandal. But we will get to that and explain better in details. So what could this explanation be? Why were these dead bodies there in the shrine, in the forest? just littered around. Maybe they're not supposed to be littered, but for what is worth, they were supposed to be there. I don't know if they were supposed to be littered the way they were, but they were supposed to be there. They were supposed to be brought there. The explanation is quite a mysterious one. One that would leave you holding your breath and making you wonder, what the hell? So upon the discovery of these coffins with dead people in it, the police chief and his guys went deeper into the shrines where they arrested over 40 native doctors with over 50 worshippers. And in these individual shrines that they raided, they also were able to count over a hundred human skulls. Now put in mind that the dead bodies that they saw in the coffins had their head in it. So these skulls that they found were most likely in the shrines of their or for the where the the gods or the images or the statues were so that was where they recovered these other shrines from so yeah and it was said about 50 to 100 human skulls were recovered and you see this infamous picture where a man is holding a casket along with uh, other people around him with human skulls all around them this picture is mostly used to tell the clifford orgy story except these are the actual images of the people arrested in the okija shrine raid in 2004 and not the clifford orgy story but the big question is how did we get here how did the most notable and powerful shrines of all Okija shrines get to this point where the police had to be involved and had to bring the priests and worshippers to their knees. What was even their crime? Was it murder? Well, we're about to find out, so stick around. We're going to briefly look at the origin of the Okija shrine, that is the Okugwapu shrine itself, a brief history as recorded by the media, and then we will get to the point. Before we get there, let's understand how the Okija shrine operates. Let's understand the idea of the Okija shrine. Let's just get the mental picture so you can understand what it is and uh, how they practice what they practice. The Okija shrine is not just one shrine. It's a series of over a hundred different shrines in Okija community in Yala and Ambra State. There were sub shrines with branches and people were at liberty to even open up their own shrines and start their own uh, offer and start their own consultation. To put it in a better mental picture, think of it as churches, especially here in Nigeria. You could go to a particular neighborhood and find at least 10 church in one street. You could even see about two deeper life in one particular avenue, five Christ embassy in one neighborhood. That was how the shrines were in Okija. They were numerous. They were many. So when you hear of Okija shrine, it's not just one shrine. However, when it comes down to this scandal that we're talking about, the Okija shrine scandal, it's mostly referenced to one particular shrine which they call the Oguguapu shrine. So the Oguguapu shrine happens to be the particular shrine in Okija that was affected by this particular scandal that we are talking about. Uh, according to Wikipedia or according to um, the internet, Okija Shrine is used interchangeably with the uh, Ogoguapo Shrine. But for clear understanding, put in mind that there are different shrines in Okija communities, so many of them. And a lot of these shrines have existed even before the white man came. So this was not something that was new. Remember, this happened in 2004. These shrines have been existing many, many years before then. Even after the scandal, the shrines still stand still this day. Christianity came, the shrines were still there functioning. The deities and the priesthood were being passed from generation to generation. And back in the day, the Okija Shrine played a very unique role in the community there in Anambra State. A unique role I think they still do up to this day. Now, let's dive into a little bit of history. You see, unlike what we are being told in Nollywood movies as regards the Igbo community, pre-colonial Igbo society did not have 
Igwe's and Kings, just the way they portray in these epic movies, Igwe, King, and all of that. The pre-colonial, and by pre-colonial I mean before the colonial masters came into Nigeria, the Igbo community or the Igbo society did not operate with Kings and Igwe's. They were a little more communal and family and more of compound compound elders elders and basically that was how they governed themselves with kindreds and father figures there were no kings there were no igwes there were no your highness so these people lived communally and they lived um, land by land compound by compound family by family however they needed to make laws they needed to settle disputes they also needed to find answers to problems and one way they did this was through the gods through their deities and to get to the gods they had to create the shrines they had to create their deities the ones they could consult the ones that would give them answers and the one that would make fair judgment whenever there is dispute amongst two or more parties in the community and that was how the shrines came about and the deities and the gods and you know a lot of these things that basically we still talk about till this day now put in mind that this was way before christianity even came to africa or came to nigeria per se and so the only gods that they knew were the deities that they served in their respective shrines. And these deities played a very important role in the lives of these communities. And even after Christianity came, the shrines and the deities still remained. They did not go anywhere. I mean, what's better than having one god? Maybe having two gods. In case the Lord doesn't answer your prayers or give you the answer that you want, there is always the option of Amadioha or Oguguapu. And as at the time, the Oguguapu shrine was said to be the most notable and the most powerful of all the shrines in Okija. Oguguapu shrine was so powerful that they made sub shrines out of it. People would come to form their own shrines based on Oguguapu and call it a name and attach Oguguapu to it. So that was actually what a lot of people were doing up till the time of 2004. Even up to now, Oguguapu still have sub shrines named after it, inspired by it or you know, alleged to be powered by Oguguapu. Now we're going to look at the origin of Oguguapu shrine itself. And it's a very interesting legend. It's a story that I think is quite fascinating. Maybe this would be the most important part of this entire video because I like the legend, I like the stories it's giving. Even if you don't believe in it, you still have to find it interesting to listen to and learn about. Now, according to what I got from the research that I made, Oguguapu was said to be a woman and it's unclear what decade, but I'm sure this was way before the white man came. There was a woman called Oguguapu who was married to a man named Ubahu Ezike. Legend had it that Oguguapu had a farm and she was a very successful farmer. And when she goes to her farm in her farmland, she would plant a lot of cassava, rice, beans, a lot of crops in her farm. They were, it, it was a very rich farm. But subsequently, she began getting robbed. Towards the harvest period, she would come to her farm and realize that people had stolen her cassava. They had dug up her crops and they had stolen them. Her land would be filled with holes of all the things she had planted being harvested without her knowledge. And it frustrated her as it would anybody. I mean, that is messed up. And so Oguguapu began complaining to the villagers. Like I said, there were no kings then, there were no traditional single-headed rulers. So she had to communicate with all the people who she knew, all the compounds, all the family that they were close to that. See, this is what is happening. People are stealing from my farmland. Don't forget at this time, people had their own offers, they had their own deities that they created for themselves in their respective homes, in their respective compounds. And so when she was complaining to the people, to her neighbors, to the community, people started giving her charms to put in her farm, to help her prevent people from coming to steal from her farm. And that was how Oguguapu got different charms from different people in the community. People were just giving her charms, you know, more like they were, I, I don't think they all knew they were all giving her charms. When she goes to meet this particular person, she would complain, they would give her something, yeah, take, put this in your land and it will help you. She goes and complains to this person, the same thing, they gave her, and that was how she got as much charms as she could get from everyone. And she took all of them into her farm because, you know, she was not taking chances. At least if one doesn't work, the other would work. And if the other doesn't work, the other other ones would work. And that was how Oguguapu took all the charms to her farm and buried it at different places. And she decided to see what would happen. And that was it. That was how the charms began to work. It's not like it worked immediately the way we see it in the movies, like 
they go to the farm and thunder would strike and they would just oh they would just die apparently it turned out that over time it was said those people who went to steal from her farm after the charms had been buried began suffering some consequences maybe even after she planted the charms they were still rubbing from her but then it took a while it took a while for these charms to work and they did not work like instantly it took days even months and how they knew the charms were working was because when some youths or some other people who were familiar in the community began to fall sick and die they began to confess they were confessing that okay they were the ones behind stealing from her farm and after they stole from her farm they started suffering some um heel fates they started having bad locks going through thumb oils up to the point that they felt so sick and having strange illnesses and they all felt the force to confess that they were the ones stealing from Oguguapu shrine and that was how people started knowing that this woman's shrine is very powerful the people who had been going there to steal are now making confessions and asking for forgiveness it's unclear if she forgave them but basically when they die they make the confessions and that is how people know that the charms that this woman had put in her farm was working and working very well very effective very strange and very powerful i mean it's making these people confess and that was it that was how the Oguguapu shrine began to get notability it began to become quite popular there were still other shrines working at the time so it's not like this is the origin of all the shrines. this is just the origin of the Oguguapu shrine so this is not the origin of all the shrines so people hearing about how this woman's farm was making people confess they started giving respect to the woman's farm people were avoiding it after many years Oguguapu was said to have died after she died a farm was now kept and made into a shrine attracting priests and worshippers and people who are supposed to be the chosen ones to come and worship the gods and appease the gods because this was a farmland that made people confess their sins before they died so clearly this was going to be a symbol of power and apparently according to the legend that was how Oguguapu shrine came to be over time the shrine was built and the gods were made and the offer was created and with time it became a center for justice it became a place where people who had dispute would come to settle their dispute that is basically how most of all the shrines were said to have worked at the time so this Oguguapu shrine was like a center for justice for disputes if two persons had a misunderstanding or had a business that did not go well or had a deal where one felt cheated by the other they brought it to Oguguapu shrine if one party is not even present and the other one is there to make the report the Oguguapu shrine will summon the second party no matter where you were it's not like they used the mirror like we would see in the movies or they went to the river to do all those reflections maybe they did that back then but from what i gathered the shrine people the shrine operators were pretty lettered so they knew how to write letters they had a letter heading so they would basically compose a letter and we bill it or put it in the post office and send it to whoever they were trying to summon down to the occasion shrine and that was how they summoned these people these parties involved in a dispute maybe before the invention of paper and writing and all of those english i guess maybe they just summoned them with the mirrors and the reflections or with the town criers it's unclear how they did it back then but up until 2000 and four that was how uh, the people were being summoned at okija shrine through the letters through letter headings and through uh, the post office you will be in your house and you get your letter you've been summoned to okija shrine regarding a dispute you had with this person and you're expected to show up when you show up you and the party will make the oath or will swear the oath and from then on it's up to Oguguapu to decide whoever is guilty will be killed will die not instantly again like we mostly see in the movies where the thunder will strike the guilty person there and then it's being said that it takes a while it takes time after the two parties who have the dispute have come to Oguguapu to plead their case and swear their oath they go back to their normal lives the guilty person slowly slowly begin to face um, thumb oils bad luck business failure their loved ones begin to fall sick maybe they lose a child or they lose a wife they get accidents and over time this series of bad luck just pile up to the point where they now fall sick or maybe just die instantly and that is how the shrine was said to operate as at then and i think same thing now to put it clearly the priests were not the ones killing nobody gets killed at okuguapo shrine it's up to the gods to do the killing so it's not like 
people were getting murdered by the priest or the native doctors and all of that. That's not how it worked. They believed that the god, Sogogwapo herself, is the one who goes around to torment and punish the guilty person in their disputes. And then it's also said if you're someone and you don't show up, anything you see, you take. Regardless of whether or not you show up, the shrine will still take its course. But according to the worshippers, they say for a fact and they repeated it, if you are not guilty, you have nothing to fear. What you ask for won't be that easy. I don't care how hard it is. But the girl's hands are clean. No, they are not. Ogogwapu will not kill you. It only kills the guilty person, the person at fault. And a lot of people believed it. A lot of people patronized this shrine. This shrine was getting visitors. See, the court of law then in Nigeria was not going to work and it was basically slow. So, and people had powers to maneuver it and pay their way out of it. That was why a lot of people seek solace in these shrines. Politicians, people were coming from different states in the country just to visit the Ogogwapu shrine to settle their disputes. Even the story we talked about regarding Ezego of Hiala, the one of the richest billionaires as at then. There are rumors that he was a victim of the Ogugwapo shrine killing. That someone who he, uh, he had a business deal with summoned him and he did not show up and he now had other series of accidents that we talked about in the video. So the Ogugwapo shrine was known for this. It was believed to be the center of justice. The justice that was very very brutal if I must say because if you're guilty you are dying you're getting killed. There is no in-between. The guilty one dies. Maybe die before the other party, I guess. Although some sources claim that if you run back to confess and apologize and make peace, you might get a chance to be saved. Other than that, if you hold on to your own oath and you stand before the four and swear that you're not the guilty one, there might be no chance for you. Now that you've gotten the idea of how it worked, let's move on to where the strange parts of this old practice come in. Because when someone is believed to have been killed by Ogugwapu, what happens to their dead body? Now, this will take us back to the raiding. Remember when the police chief came into the Ogugwapu shrine and started seeing coffins everywhere? Yes, these are the people believed to have been killed by Ogugwapu or by the shrines. You see, it's practical that when someone is killed by Ogugwapu and the family and loved ones of these victims or who have been killed believe that it's a result of the oaths or the swearing that they had with Ogugwapu shrine, they bring their loved ones to the shrine. They don't take them to the cemetery and they don't bury them. For some, they do bury. That is, depends on the family and how deep rooted they are in their culture for others they bring them there and most times they just drop the pictures i think they drop photograph okay let's say if a particular loved one did not want to bring their victims casket or corpse to the shrine to dump or drop they may bury them in a cemetery or in their compound but bring the photograph of the deceased one to the shrine and part of the things that the police officers and the police people who came to raid the shrine saw were photographs of people they saw photographs of a lot of victims these were victims who had been killed by Ogugwapu believed to have been killed by Ogugwapu and they also saw a list of names in a, in a document, a list of names in a diary, a register of people who had visited and used the services of the shrine. It was a whole long list of names. So yes, basically that was it. When a loved one is believed to have been killed by Ogugwapu, the family of these people bring the body to the shrine and drop it there and go. Which explains the body that the police officer saw when they entered the forest. The coffins and caskets of people who had been suited up with cotton wool in their nose. That was it. These were the people. They were not stolen. They were not murdered by anyone. These were people who had died at their own time with their loved ones, maybe by accident, maybe by sickness. And during the burial period or when it was time for burial, the family brought them to the shrine because they believed it was the gods that killed them. And that was it. That explains why all the caskets were all littered around there. But the problem is they were not supposed to be littered. I'm sure the government was aware of what was going on with these beliefs and how people bring their loved ones. The government doesn't have a problem. However, it was supposed to be like a proper 
practice there should be a proper system and i think from what i learned the shrines have their own morgue they have their own mortuary uh house where they now put the dead ones believed to have been killed and i think most times they do their own private burials for them maybe they have a place where they bury the people believed to have been killed by the gods so if this is how the people believe system works there should be a proper management of at least these dead people that they believe was killed by the gods so the problem with the raid the reason why it was believed that this police got a tip off was the way these bodies were being mismanaged not to mention the worshippers having human skulls and doing a lot of weird things we will come to that later that is something we will talk about however when it came to those bodies that were littered around they were mismanaged it was poor management and i think that is a law that they were breaking mismanagement of corpse it's unclear but just putting the cast kids and the dead people leaving them all around the bush exposing them to the atmosphere was a problem there should have been people who would have at least known that okay they had to arrange it and keep it somewhere again put in mind that it's not just one shrine it's like many shrines there so if a particular shrine did the justice intervention for two people and one of their own people dies their family will bring it to that particular shrine and drop it there if the priest of that shrine is not available the coffin will be there for only god knows how sometimes when the priest or the native doctors come to their shrines they're not even sure whose coffin is whose you know okay who's responsible for this and it just became tattered and littered and it became quite careless which kind of became an eyesore which then attracted people to make the report that this mismanagement of deceased people is an extreme case of negligence it's very extreme poor mismanagement and there is no wonder why the police had to be involved but the next big question is how did the infamous and reputable okuguapu shrine turn into a forest of horror due to mismanagement i mean they weren't like this before this was not how it used to be. How come all of a sudden this reputable Oguguapu shrine started having dead bodies littered around, people worshipping the gods with human skulls? How did they get to that part? I mean, there were even rumors that there were more worse practices than just that. I guess maybe it was more than just the littered dead bodies and the human skulls. There were now accusations or claims that people are now killing people in Oguguapu shrine. People are now using humans as sacrifice. Now, put in mind back then, when Oguguapu shrine was operating it wasn't business it wasn't justice for business when you come you have a problem you state your case is the priest listings the other parties are summoned it's not money you're not paying however when you feel like appreciating the gods or appreciating the priest especially if justice has been done to you people gave gifts to this priest people gave gifts to the shrines some gave money gifts which can be a lot of money some gave goats chickens cows some gave lands i mean this priests were people too they went to schools they had to eat they have families to feed they have children to take to school so these gifts were useful and helpful in running the shrine in managing the shrine so how come all of a sudden this flourishing okija shrine suddenly fell into a case of mismanagement how come well again there is an explanation to it i guess one that would probably help us understand how all of that came to be and why the police got involved where the mismanagement came from and how it got to that state that it became so bad that even a fellow native doctor had to be the one to tip off the police and make this report so basically like we have talked about the okija shrine had their system again the justice was not transactional it was believed to be free you don't pay to get justice however you appreciate the gods if you feel like if you think you've been served well if you think they've helped answer your case or giving you the answer that you're looking for and people did that in grand style you need to put in mind that politicians were coming to these shrines for only god knows what people businessmen big businessmen i'm telling you anambra state is one of the homes to the biggest businessmen even back then so if businessmen had disputes they most likely wouldn't even go to court they all came to the shrine so if these people are done well and they are giving the justice and they feel like appreciating the gods you best to believe that they will be dropping huge amounts of money some are giving lands to the gods giving 
cows and supplies and giving money, food. Sometimes they even offer to pay the school fees of the uh, wash, uh, the priests, the chief priests' children. That was how these shrines flourished. And so, seeing how it's been, seeing how it operates, you're bound to understand that this can actually get bad. And if you don't see it, let me explain it to you. Because I love my Igbo brothers and sisters. But one thing you gotta know is, <laughs> they will make a business out of anything, including a shrine. Seeing how the Ogugwapu or the original Ogugwapu shrine flourished then. Throughout their time of the 90s, the late 90s and early 2000s, the shrine business began to see a surge in youth involvement. All of a sudden, young men, young boys were now coming in and opening their shrines. They were now opening their shrines and opening it under the name of Ogugwapu. And it was said there was a shrine leader then, the person in charge of the shrine as that then, was the one allowing these people troop in. Maybe they were giving him money to let them operate their shrines. And when these young people were coming into the shrine world to open their shrines and create their own or fall in different aspects of the forest, they had one thing in mind and that was to make money. They were not coming here to do the same old thing that has been done in the past. They came there for the money. Not be answers on the fine. Not be justice on our wants. We go give them the justice, but you give us the money. And that surge in youth involvement kind of led to the, the downfall or to the scandal that happened in 2004. So many young people were opening up their shrines. And at the same time, more people were still coming in with their disputes. And this Okugwapu shrine itself, the original one, was still there. However, it now had competitors. It now had other people. It now had people who were now doing, you know, they were no longer giving justice. They were now giving answers. People were now going to these various shrines to attack people individually. If you remember, the original idea of Okugwapu shrine was not to kill anyone. You not come and meet the gods and tell them that you want to kill somebody specifically. That is not Ogugwapu. It doesn't do that. It only settles dispute and whoever is guilty dies. However, when this new surge of young people became involved in the shrine and became involved in the of four creation and the other sub tiny bit of uh, shrines that they made and having their own customers, people were now coming for different things. That is why the politicians were now coming for powers. And if a politician is coming for powers, they had to make sacrifice. I guess that is where a lot of the human skulls were coming from. It's unclear the origin of those human skulls that the police caught them with, whether they came from uh, the dead people that are, had already died, or whether these shrine people or these people who came to look for powers killed their victims and brought it there. That is a possibility too. So, still with the surge of these young people involving in the shrine situation, in the shrine business, it now got in the increase of more people dying from their gods and more increase increase in people bringing their loved ones to drop in the forest. Originally, in the initial time, as at then, Ogogwapu had its morgue, had its mortuary where they take their victims to. Maybe the family would bring it to the forest and the people who work for the shrine would take the body to the morgue. But with the surge of these new young people coming in, some of them don't even have morgue. You remember, they can't use the original Ogogwapu morgue because they need to create theirs and they did not have theirs, which meant the bodies that their own or four had killed would have to be in the forest. That is probably how and why the police came and saw over 80 dead people littered around. Just as we've already said, the youths in the community, the educated ones, who trooped into the shrine and turned it into a business were the ones said to have been responsible for the mismanagement, for the chaos and for the whole eyesore that the police chief and his team witnessed when they got to the shrine. As well as all the other worshippers that were arrested with human skulls, literally the entire blame for the scandal that dawned upon the Ogugwapu shrine is put upon the educated youths of the community who decided to come into the shrine and make it into a business. And that is it guys, that is the entire scenery and the entire story behind the Okija shrine and the scandal that followed it in 2004. Now the aftermath, what happened afterwards, after they had been arrested and sent to prison, what, what happened next? What, what was the fate of Okija? 
just right. Well, like I said, not much is known. There are a few articles here and there. Apparently, the people who were arrested were taken. It's not clear if they were charged with anything because I don't know if they'll be able to prove they killed these people. But clearly, I think the police and the system understood how the shrine operated. At the same time, we didn't hear so much about it. But we knew the shrine was affected. We knew the Okija shrine went down on the slope like it's crashed and it became popular for the wrong reasons. There were rumors and, story, uh, and stories flying. It was a horror when these images of these coffins and dead people littered around the forest were shown on television. So clearly, it was sending the message out there that that was an evil forest. I mean, that was an evil forest and pretty much became just, I guess that was where a lot of Nollywood movies got their inspiration for, for a lot of these um, evil forest themed movies and rituals and all of those stories that came up afterwards after 2004 but today the Okija shrine still operates it's still there the shrines are still there the forests are still there people who believe in them still go to them for justice one of the reasons why these people were so successful then was because of the lack of justice it's just unfortunate that the young boys or the young youths decided to turn it into a business leading it into a very high rate and poor standard of management and it's just sad but i guess it's for the best i guess it just it was time for the shrine to take its cause and end i'm not very sure why they had to let it happen but it happened and Akisha shrine saw a reduction in clients a reduction in customers i guess the politicians who were coming to patronize them had to go to other shrines because i don't know if they can do without it i mean i don't want to really want to say things but you know we hear a lot of them and the shrine i guess maybe they went to the bad and forest of horror <laughs> Anyhow, Shah, this is the story of the Okija Shrine as far as we know and as far as it is being written and said about. People still go there, it's still present. I think there are videos of it around the internet. People visit the shrine. I feel like somebody, a particular person said that they should make the shrine a, a tourist center and I agree, honestly. It's going to be a nice thing if it's a tourist center for people to go and visit and talk about it. Hopefully, in years to come, it's going to be a tourist center. It should be, it should be pretty Preserved and the stories should be, you know, kept there. It's a dark past, but I mean, it's part of our history, honestly. So we might as well turn it into a tourist center and repeat the story for more generations to come. Some people have the opinion that they should burn it down and pour it with holy water. You know, I guess those are the church god, but I don't think they should burn it down. I don't think so. I don't agree. I feel like it should be preserved and used as a tourist center. Even though people still believe in these deities and they still go there to seek answers and justice, but it's not as much as it used to be back in the olden days. You know, things have changed now and I guess it's time for Okija shrines to preserve its legacy and history despite the scandal that was with it. Even though the spokesperson, the chief priest, have spoken out to let people know that the news blew it out of proportion. And like I've said before, and I also said it previously, unlike what people were saying, the shrine and the priest and the people who worked there did not kill these bodies and these people you saw there. These were people brought in, so they don't kill. It's the Gugwapu they believe kills. So unlike what they said, you know, people were like, the money rituals, they were killing people for money rituals, the bodies there were being killed, but that was not the case. It was the loved ones of these deceased victims that brought their deceased loved ones there because they felt they were killed by Okuguapu Shrine. And that's the case. That is it. That is the story. So, you guys let me know what you think. Let me know what your thoughts are. Do you think that the Okija Shrine should be demolished and gone for good? I mean, these are people's history and people still believe in it. Or do you think it should be preserved and turned into a tourist center where people can go and visit without fear and learn about it and learn about the story? I mean, that would bring more money into the community if you ask me. To bring more money, more fame and hopefully people can understand the history and past and understand, maybe see the register of all the people who have been there too because I would love to see the register of what the people who have visited there. There was a 
particular politician that was said to have gone there to swear allegiance to a particular party and he had to bait and I, I, I don't remember his name but I guess you know I'll put the image or video on the screen for you to see. I think there are videos circulating about the particular politician because it was said other politicians also went there for money, for powers, to win elections. I guess that was the era of the educated youths because the original idea of Ogugwapu was justice for dispute. But if people were going there to seek powers and seek wealth and seek and kill specific people, I guess that would be for the educated youths that came to supposedly mismanage everything. I guess those are the people who attended to those customers who wanted, um, you know, powers and wealth and to win elections. So, thank you guys for watching. I hope you like this video, share, subscribe, comment where you're watching from, let me know your thoughts and turn on the notification button. Should there be any new video, you'll be the first to get notified. Thank you guys for watching. Please stay on my channel. See you next time. Oh my god. I think I'm done. I'm done. This was a success. Let's toast to that. Thank you. This is green tea. All right.